You're at Matthew chapter 28, verse 1, and ready to go. Say amen. Amen. Oh, that's great. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said to the women, Fear not ye, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He's not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. Would you pray with me, church? Heavenly Father, may the words from my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight today. O oh Lord, my strength and my Redeemer, I pray that you'll speak through me, and I pray that everything that's done today will bring honor and glory to your kingdom. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll remove the distractions right now. I pray for your Holy Spirit to come in here. And Father God, I just pray with everything that I've got, that you'll get out of my mind, to my mouth, to the hearts of everybody here, the message that you want them to hear today. May somebody get saved like they did in first service. May we all be challenged to go quickly and tell the gospel message in Jesus' name. Amen. The church, before we can truly appreciate this first day that changed my life, we've got to know the whole context. I talk to you about knowing the context all the time. So we need to know what happened in Matthew chapter 27. In Matthew 27, the chief priests and the elders condemned Jesus Christ to death for blasphemy because he claimed that he was the Son of God. Now, for everybody else on earth, that would be blasphemy, but not for Jesus because he truly was the only begotten Son of God who came to earth 33 years before, born of a virgin, and he lived a perfect, sinless life so he could save us from our sins. Well, after the chief priests and elders condemned Jesus to death, he stood trial before Pilate. And Pilate could find no fault in Jesus. In fact, I truly believe there was a part of Pilate that wanted to set Jesus free. I know his wife did because his wife sent and told Pilate to have nothing to do with this just man because she had suffered many things in a dream that day because of him. Well, there was a custom in those days at the big feast that they would release a prisoner to the people. And so Pilate asked them if they wanted him to release Jesus or a really famous robber and murderer by the name of Barabbas. Well, the Bible says that the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask for Barabbas. And so then Pilate asked, well, what do you want me to do with Jesus, which is called Christ? And the crowd shouted, let him be crucified. Pilate said, why? What evil has this man done? But the crowd got more stirred up and they got more worked up and they hollered, let him be crucified. Let him be crucified. Let him be crucified. <laughs> so Pilate, seeing that he couldn't do anything with the crowd, he took a basin of water and he washed his hands before the multitude and he said, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. He released Barabbas he had Jesus scourged. And then he turned Jesus over to be crucified. Now I want to call a time out here. Some of you don't know what it means to be scourged. It's absolutely forevermore gruesome. And I want you to hear what it meant when Jesus was scourged. They stripped Jesus of all his clothes. And they took his hands and tied them above his head to a post. And the Roman legionnaire would step forward and he had this short whip. And this short whip, it had several heavy leather thongs with it with two small balls of lead on each end of it. And he took that small whip and again, and again, and again, and again, <coughs> he would slam it across Jesus' shoulder, his back, and his legs. Now at first, that whip cut through the skin only, but the more he whipped Jesus, the more they cut deeper into his tissue. It started oozing blood. Then it started squirting blood. Then his back got so bad that the skin was just hanging in strips, and it was an entire area of unrecognizable tissue. As if that scourging wasn't bad enough. They took Jesus after the scourge into the common hall, and they decided we're just going to play with him a little bit and mock him. So they stripped off all his clothes again. More pain from where he'd just been scourged. They put a scarlet robe on. They made a crown of thorns and they put it on his head. 
They put a stick in his right hand and they bowed down before him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Hail, King of the Jews. As they mocked him. Then they spit on him. Then they took that stick out of his right hand and they hit him upside the head with it. Then they mocked him some more. Finally, they took the scarlet robe off of him and they put his own clothes back on him and they led him away to be crucified at Calvary. On his way to Calvary, Jesus fell beneath the heavy load of the cross. And so they got a man named Simon of the country of Cyrene to carry it the rest of the way forward. And once they got to Calvary, they threw Jesus backward on the cross, his shoulders against the wood. Again, more pain from where he was scourged. The legionnaire felt for the depression at the end of his wrist, and they put a heavy, square, wrought iron nail through his wrist on both sides. Then they went down to his feet, put his left foot on top of his right foot, found the place down there, and a nail was driven through the arch of each of his legs. As Jesus sagged down on the cross, once they put that cross up, he sagged down on the cross with all of that weight on his wrist and his feet. As it was there on his wrist, excruciating, fiery pain shoots through the fingers, up the arm, and it explodes in the brain. So he pushes himself upward to avoid the torment and he places his full weight on the nail in his feet. And again, more pain, more agony there in his feet. His muscles began to cramp. And Jesus starts gasping for air because he physically can't push up on the nails to catch his breath. While all of that was going on, the Bible says that Roman soldiers were there at the foot of the cross and they parted his garments. And they cast lots, fulfilling the prophecy in Psalms 22, 18. They part my garments among them, and they cast lots upon my vesture. They set a sign above Jesus' head with an accusation that read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. While Jesus was there hanging on the cross, people came by Him and mocked Him and said, You said you could destroy the temple and build it again in three days. Well, if you're the Son of God, why don't you come off the cross? It was not only regular people, the chief priests and the elders came by too. And they mocked him and they said, He saved others, but himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross and we will believe. But while Jesus was still there on the cross, church, darkness covered the whole land from noon till 3 o'clock that afternoon. And at 3 o'clock, Jesus cried, My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? When he said that, they put a sponge filled with vinegar on a stick. They handed it up to him to drink. And with one final gasp of breath, he cried, It is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And with that, Jesus yielded up the ghost, and he died. Immediately at the death of Jesus, there was a great earthquake, and the veil of the temple was written too from the top to the bottom. The graves were opened, and many bodies appeared of the saints who were dead, arose after the resurrection, and they appeared to many people in Jerusalem. There was a centurion standing by, and he witnessed all of this, and he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There was a rich man there named Joseph of Arimathea, and he came and begged Pilate for the body of Jesus. Pilate, deli Pilate delivered Jesus to him, and he and a man named Nicodemus wrapped the body of Jesus in linen cloths, and they laid him in Joseph's own tomb which was nearby to Calvary. The Bible tells us that Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, were there with them, and they witnessed them bury Jesus' body. On the next day, the chief priests and the elders came to Pilate, and they asked for a guard to be at the tomb because they remembered Jesus saying before he died, that he would rise again on the third day. So Pilate gave him the guards, he gave him a seal to seal the tomb, and he told them to make it as sure as they possibly could. That's what happened in chapter 27. Now we're at chapter 28, our passage for the day. It's now the first day of the week, the third day after Jesus' death. And Mary Magdalene, along with Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, comes to the tomb, and she has spices that they want to anoint the body of Jesus. In verse 2, church, there was another earthquake. And this time it was an earthquake because the angel of the Lord was descending from heaven to roll back the stone from the door of the tomb. And this angel had a special message to deliver the women. Now, church, I want to break down this message today line by line 
and showed you how it's applicable to us today in 2013. The very first thing that the angel said to the women in verse 5, Fear not ye. Fear not ye. Now listen, I don't know about you, but I can understand why the two Marys were scared. I mean, think about it. They came to the tomb expecting to find a stone rolled in front of the door with guards beside it. Instead, there was an earthquake. They see an angel with a countless light lightning, clothing arrangement, white as snow, and he's sitting on this stone, and the stone in front of the tomb, it's rolled over to the side, and the guards they were expecting to see, they're passed out over here on the ground, literally scared to death. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, church, but I get it. I get it. I can totally see why the two Marys were scared and why the angel had to tell them to fear not. But do you know what else, church? This message to fear not wasn't just for this particular situation in the Scriptures. God created us. He knows the battles that you and I fight every day with fear. So over and over and over again in the Bible, God gives us reason after reason after reason to fear not. Are you fighting discouragement, church? Fear not. Deuteronomy 121 says, Behold, the Lord thy God has sent the land before thee. Go up and possess it as the Lord God of thy fathers has sent unto thee. Fear not, neither be discouraged. Are you terrified about something, church? Fear not. Deuteronomy 20 verse 3 says, And shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint, fear not, and do not tremble, neither be terrified because of them. Is somebody trying to do harm to you, church? Fear not. Psalms 118.6 says, The Lord is on my side, I will not fear what man can do unto me. Do you think God doesn't hear your prayers? Fear not. Daniel 10.12 then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day thou didst set thy heart to understand and to chasten thyself before the Lord God. Thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Do you think you're worthless, church? Fear not. Matthew 10, 31 says, Fear ye not, therefore ye are of more value than many sparrows. Church, you can fear not, because the Lord is your shield. Genesis 15, 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield, and thy exceeding great reward. Fear not, church, because the Lord is your salvation. Exodus 14, 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you this day. Fear not, church, he's your deliverer. Joshua 10, 8. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thy hand. There shall not be any man of them stand before thee. You can fear not, church, because he's your confidence. Psalms 27, 3. Though a host should camp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise up against me, in this will I be confident. You can fear not, church, because he's your peace and your strength. Daniel 10, 19. It said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be unto thee. Be strong, yea, be strong. Now listen to me, church. That's good preaching. If I am the one doing it, if this was a Pentecostal church, somebody would be running around the building right now. There's somebody listening on the radio just tore off pieces from this preaching. You better wake up and listen, church. He's your help. Isaiah 41, 13. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. You can fear not because the Lord is your Redeemer. Isaiah 43, 1. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. You can fear not, church, because the Lord can and will do great things. Joel 2, 21. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Fear not, because he'll never fail you, nor will he ever forsake you. Deuteronomy 31, 6. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Fear not, church. Psalms 46, 2 says, Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. You can fear not, church, because 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, 
For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. And hallelujah, church, the Lord's going to look on Philip Chambers one day just like he did old John in the Revelation. And he's going to say, And when I saw him, I found his feet dead and laid in his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I'm he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. Amen. And have the key of hell and death. Now, honey, if you finally got the message loud and clear, the angel wasn't just telling the, telling the two Marys to fear not. They weren't just supposed to tell the disciples to fear not. No, sir, we church. It's a message sounding through the centuries all the way to us today in 2013. Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. It don't matter what happens in your life. Fear not. It don't matter what Dr. Chambers says. Fear not. It don't matter if you got more month than money. Fear not. Church, have you got the point? If you've got it, shout it. Fear not. Amen. I want to hear you say it again. Fear not. Fear not. Amen. Amen. Whatever you do, fear not. Amen. Whatever's going on in your life, Amen. fear not. Amen. The angel goes on to say in verse 5 of Matthew 28, I know you seek Jesus which was crucified. Church, let me ask you a question. Who are you seeking today? Seriously, examine your hearts. Tell me the truth. Who are you seeking today or what are you seeking today? Oh, Brother Philip, we're here seeking Jesus today. After all, we're here at church on Easter Sunday. Friend, all over the country, churches are full on Easter Sunday and many of the people there are seeking Jesus. That's right. I want to give you a newsflash. Just because you go to church don't mean you're a seeker of Jesus Christ. Some people go to church because their parents made it. Some people go to church because their grandma was buried in the cemetery. Some people go to church out of habit. Some people go to church out of obligation because they got a job to do. Some people go to church because it's the happening place to be. Some people go to church because they like the music and they want to see a show each Sunday. If that describes any of y'all here today, don't get me wrong, I'm glad you're here. But you're here for the wrong reason. And I'd like to introduce you to Jesus which was crucified. Mm -hmm. Because once you get to know Jesus better, you'll figure out the real reason to come to church. That's right. In infancy, he startled a king. In childhood, he puzzled doctors. In manhood, he ruled the course of nature, walking on the billows as if they were pavement, and he hushed the sea to sleep. He healed the multitudes without medicine and made no charges for his service. He never wrote a book. Yet all the libraries of the country could not hold the books that had been written about him. He never wrote a song, yet he has furnished the theme for more songs than all the songwriters put together. He never founded a college, but all the schools put together can't boast of having so many students. He never marshaled an army. He never drafted a soldier nor fired a gun. Yet no leader has ever had more volunteers who have under his orders made more rebels surrender without a shot fired. He never practiced psychiatry, yet he's healed more broken hearts than all the doctors far and near. Once each week, church, the wheels of commerce cease their turning, and multitudes wind their way to houses of worship to pay homage and respect to him. Now listen to me. The names of proud statesmen of Greece and Rome have come and gone. The names of past scientists, philosophers, and theologians have come and gone. But the name of this man abounds more and more. Those time has spread 2,000 years almost between the people of this generation and the scene of his crucifixion, yet he still lives. Herod could not destroy him. Hallelujah, the grave can't hold him. He stands forth on the highest pinnacle of heavenly glory, proclaimed of God, acknowledged by the angels, adored by the saints, feared by the devils, because he's the living, personal Jesus Christ that was crucified. He's our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 Now some of you are here today. You're seeking Jesus, but He's not top priority in your life. Instead of seeking Jesus with all of your heart, you're seeking money and wealth first. And you're giving Jesus your leftovers. You're seeking to climb the corporate ladder first and giving Jesus the table scraps of your time. You're seeking the approval of your friends first and giving Jesus a half-hearted effort. You're seeking that big catfish or that big bug or that big turkey. But let me tell you something, bro. 
You might lose that big turkey when he puts the slip on you like he did me and Brandon yesterday. But here's some good news about Jesus Christ which was crucified. The Bible says if we'll seek him, we'll find him. He's not like some turkey or some big buck that's trying to play hide and seek with his church. No, sir. Jesus wants you to find him. In fact, he is standing at your heart's door right now, knocking, saying, let me in. Let me in. Let me save you from your sins. It's not his will that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. Friend, are you seeking Jesus today with all your heart, soul, mind? The next thing that the angel says in verse 6 is he's not here. He's not here. So just where is the body of Jesus? Well, some say he never was buried. Well, that can't be true because we've got a bunch of eyewitness accounts that he was. Some say that the disciples stole the body. Well, that can't be true for two reasons. Number one, the tomb was made doubly sure by Pilate with guards that put a seal on the door. And number two, if it was a hoax, why in the world would the disciples die for a lie? Some people think that the chief priests and the elders stole the body. But if that was so, why didn't they produce the dead body of Jesus and debunk the spread of Christianity? Friend, there's only one explanation for where the body of Jesus was. And the angel says it next. He's risen. Just as he said. You see, church, Jesus told the disciples not once, not twice, but three different times that he would be crucified and on the third day arise again. He first said it in Matthew 16, 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. The second time he told them was in Matthew 17. And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceedingly sorry. The third and final time he told them was in Matthew chapter 20 and shall deliver unto him the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. Church, in Matthew, Mark, and John, Jesus appeared to the, after the resurrection to Mary Magdalene. In Luke and 1 Corinthians, he appeared after the resurrection to Peter in Jerusalem. In Mark and Luke, he appeared to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. In Mark, Luke, and John, he appeared to ten disciples behind closed doors. In John and 1 Corinthians, he appeared to all the disciples, including Doubting Thomas. In John, he appeared to seven disciples while fishing. In Matthew, he appeared to eleven disciples on the mountain. In 1 Corinthians, he appeared to 500 people and his brother James. In Luke, in the book of Acts, they watched him ascend to heaven, and he appeared to the apostle Paul on the Damascus Road. Friend, there's so much eyewitness evidence that Jesus rose from the grave, there's no way you can doubt whether it really happened or not. Amen. But my favorite part, my favorite part of the angel's message to the women, and truthfully, church, the message to us too, is at the end of verse 6, when the angel says, Come, see the place where the Lord lay. Now, friend, the angel's not just inviting the women to go see it. He's inviting me and you to come see it too. Now listen, if we could all load up on a jet airplane and go to Medina, Saudi Arabia, we could see where the body of Muhammad's buried. We could go to India and see the eight different places where the body of Buddha's buried. But praise God, church, if we load up and go to Jerusalem today, just outside of town, we won't find the body of Jesus buried because He's not there. Amen. He's risen just as he said he would. And then finally, in verse 7, the angel gives one last message to the women. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. Now guys, he also tells us in other passages of Scripture to make haste and to go quickly. When he called the disciples to leave their nets and become fishers of men, the Bible says that straightway or immediately they left their nets. When he told Zacchaeus to come down out of the tree, he said, make haste, come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And friend, Jesus is telling me and you, now, through the message of the angel, to go quickly and tell the world that he's risen from the dead. Now church, why do we need to go quickly? Why do we need to go quickly? He's coming back. Listen to me, it's a matter of life and death. Yes. It's a matter of heaven and hell. People all over this country, people all over this state, people all over this nation, and people all over the world are going to hell 
every single day because we haven't gone quickly and told them the life-saving good news that Jesus Christ lived a perfect life, died on the cross for our sins, and rose again the third day. A lot of us think we can put off telling our friends, our family, our co-workers, or our classmates about Jesus Christ. We say, oh, it's not a big deal. We can wait and tell them some other day. Friend, there's nothing more important. There's no need to put off telling them for another minute, much less another day. And y'all sitting there looking at me like a mule looking at a new game. So let me see if I can explain it to you in language you'll understand, all right? <clears throat> when the Chambers family goes on vacation, Aaron is in charge of packing the clothes because I can't pack the suit, all right? Now let's just say, who gave me that? <laughs> Been preaching about Jesus for 25 minutes. He ain't had nobody amen. Talk about packing clothes. All right, so Aaron packs the clothes. Now let's just say that we were leaving for vacation today after church on a Sunday. Aaron would start packing on Tuesday or Wednesday. She's shaking her head. This is the truth. She start packing on Tuesday or Wednesday. She'd pack all my clothes up, and I'd have to wear the same pair of drawers for four or five days because she done got it all packed up. <laughs> now listen to me. Y'all are laughing. Y'all are laughing. But if we'll work that hard to go that far ahead to pack up for vacation, why in the world are we working that hard and going that far ahead to tell our friends about Jesus Christ? That's right. That's right. If we ain't putting off packing for vacation, why are we putting off telling our friends about Jesus Christ? Give me one good reason why we're putting off telling our friends, our family, our classmates, and our co-workers about Jesus Christ and what He did for us. Nobody wants The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He goes on to say in Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, praise God, in John 3, 16, we hear some more about this eternal or everlasting life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And in Romans 10, 9, we find out how to get this everlasting life and to be saved from our sins. Romans 10, 9, look on the screen. If you'll confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Church, there's nothing we can tell our friends, our family, our co-workers, or our classmates, even complete strangers, there's nothing we can tell them that would be more important than the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. The day that Jesus rose from the dead almost 2,000 years ago, that's the first day that changed my life. The second day wasn't here that long ago. Now some of you probably think it was the day that I got married. No, I'm not talking about that day. You may think it was the day my children were born. No, I'm not talking about that day. You may think it was the day I graduated from high school. No. Nope. The day I graduated from college. No. Nope. My first day of work. No. Nope. The day that I'm talking about church, the second day that changed my life, was February the 8th, 1987. I can remember the details of that day as clear as a bell. <clears throat> because all week leading up to that day, <clears throat> I had felt this uncomfortableness in my heart. It was the Holy Spirit. He had me under conviction for my sins. And in my ignorance, as a 10-year-old boy, I thought the only time you could give your heart to Jesus was on Sunday morning at church. So on Sunday morning, February the 8th, 1987, about 12 noon, I walked the aisle of the Shiloh Coming Presbyterian Church. I took Brother Vaughn Fultz by the hand. I said, Brother Fultz, I need to be saved. And he led me in a prayer to give my heart to Jesus Christ. Now in the Cumberland Presbyterian Church, when you get saved, join the church, they bring all the elders of the church down and they stand in front of you down at the front. And they start asking you questions in front of everybody before they'll allow you to become a member. And they'll ask questions like, are you really saved? They'll ask questions like, do you believe the Bible? They'll ask questions like, do you promise to support the church? And stuff like that. And when they get through asking those questions, the preacher will look at the elders and he'll say, what's the will of the elders? Fred, I can remember. I cried during the first service. I'm going to try not to do it now. I can remember. 80-something-year-old granddaddy. The 
the man I love more than anybody in this world, Randy A.J. I can remember him standing down there with those elders with that stick. And when Brother Fault said, what's the will of the elders, my granddaddy spoke up. He said, I moved to Beery Sea. <coughs> I remember that just as plain as if it were today. After that service, Mom and Daddy, me and Brandon, went to Western Sizzling and ate over on Fort Campbell. We left Western Sizzling and we drove to Erin. And we went to see Miss Joreen, who would eventually become my piano teacher. And we went to tell her about me getting saved. And church, I can remember the details of that day so very clearly. How about you? Can you remember the details of the day that you got saved? For some of you, it was here at this church. For some of you, it was kneeling by the couch in your living room. For some of you, it was at vacation Bible school or church camp. For some of you, it was during revival, in your car, at your parents' bedroom or on the beach. But what about you? Do you remember? Do you remember? If you can't remember, Today, I'm praying for today to become the most important day of your life because you'll never make a more important decision than to give your heart to Jesus Christ. Amen. I am begging you. I am begging you. <coughs> make that decision for Jesus today. Now listen to me carefully. If you don't, I'm going to tell you straight up, you'll go to hell. Period. If you don't make that decision for Jesus, going to hell. If you do make the decision for Jesus, the joy, the splendor, and the perfection of heaven awaits. What's it going to be? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I'm so very thankful that you went to the cross. I'm so very thankful that you rose again from the dead. I'm so very thankful for the message from the angel. The message that resounds to us today to fear not. And whatever we are going got going on, Lord, we got to remember to fear not. The message from the angel, God, to whom you seek, Jesus. Lord, I pray that everybody here is seeking Jesus with all of their heart, soul, and mind. We're thankful, Lord, that you're not in the tomb anymore, that you've risen from the dead just like you said. We're thankful, Lord, that we can come quickly and see the tomb where you lay. And we pray, we're thankful, Lord, that we can go quickly and tell others about you. And I pray that all of us will do that. Heavenly Father, if there's anybody under the sound of my voice or listening on the radio today that has not accepted you as Lord and Savior, I pray that right now will be their first day.